Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 135 of the Effort Report. This is Pandemic Episode 23. I'm Elizabeth Matsui, and I'm here with Roger Pang. Hello. I was wondering if you were going to jump in and say hi or not. Show up at all. Yes, you are here. So should we dive in to follow up and other small things? Yeah, we have a number of things on our follow-up list here. Right. It may be that we never even make it to the main topic. So the first one, you want to introduce the first one? Oh, yeah. I just This is this can be quick. This I saw it on Twitter. Uh, user Christoph Molnar uh, tweeted that he uh, says, A few years into research, I finally understand how it works. A th- this thread summarizes my findings. And the thread is titled, 10 Rules to Assert Dominance in Research. And uh, it's obviously a tongue-in-cheek. Hopefully it's obvious that it's, t- <laughs> that it's tongue-in-cheek, uh, the thread. Uh, well, maybe I should say hopefully it is tongue-in-cheek. We'll never know, I suppose. But he uses a number of Breaking Bad uh, animated GIFs to uh, depict his points. So Wait, did, did you just say GIF? <laughs> yeah, I thought we've been through this already. Maybe we have. <laughs> yeah, that's how I say it. All right. Ever since I have evidence, actually, going back to like the early 90s. Oh, maybe we have talked about this. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, we I won't go through the whole thing. I just, we'll just put the link in the show notes and uh, you can take a look. I, I, have, I actually haven't seen Breaking Bad, so it wasn't as funny as it could have been, I think. But I think if you've seen Breaking Bad, probably it's better. Right. I think I've only seen a couple of episodes, but I, I enjoyed it even just for its content. Yeah. Okay. So enjoy. Next up is yours i think right yeah and this is just a intermittent reminder i think we've talked about this before but i don't know that making mistakes is expected and when you catch them that's a good thing is that it that's it so for on a couple of projects you know where i was working with mentees they you know these were happened across multiple projects people identified errors in their analysis and there was, you know, gloom and doom. And my response is, this is fantastic. There are going to be mistakes and you caught them. So that, that, that's all. I think that there can be this, first of all, mis- mistakes are going to happen, right? Yeah. And second of all, when you catch them, particularly before they're out in the published literature, but even if you catch them when it, it's, you know, published, that's a that's a good thing when they're caught. The earlier they're caught, the better. But it, this sure. is not something yeah. to. I think people can feel bad because they think, "Oh, I made a mistake." But but that's that's the norm. Right. It's not a failure. It's a mistake, or it's a it's part of the process. Right. I guess. Yeah. I guess you know. I when I encounter this with you know, students in various kinds of situations, uh, my I feel like the the important thing to get across is that this happens and you know it's uh you just have to figure out why it happened and see what anything needs to change basically right I think. yeah um all right is that it for that that was it <laughs> well we are plowing through here that's right we're gonna take an hour's worth of content and it's going to be compressed to 30 minutes that's right so i just wanted to say that um i have a new website and here's my question for you do you have a website? No, and I, I, I feel minor, mildly torn by this, right? Because people who have wet labs tend to have websites. My question for you is whether you think it's important to have a website, and, and by that I mean like a. Per, so how do you define it? Yeah, so like a personal website that you manage. I think it depends on who who you are. Really? Okay. I don't think it matters in sort of the clinical sciences world. Okay. I think it matters more, you know, if if there's someone who is sort of an expert on clinical trials and lung disease, that person doesn't matter whether they have a website or not and is unlikely to have a website. Yeah. Um, I think it matters if, you know, I know people who are bench scientists, that's how they kind of advertise their lab for, you know, graduate students and postdocs and whatnot. And um, I think their peers often um, want to look at their websites to sort of see the collection of, of activities they have going on. 
Right. That's why I think it depends on kind of who you are. Like my peers don't have personal websites. Yeah, I have noticed that. And I, but I do feel like I think there's a certain fields have a lot more kind of mixing from the outside uh, than other fields. So when I think about the laboratory scientists or like the comp bio type people that I've encountered, they're often recruiting people from outside the institution, like postdocs, students, whatever, right? And so there's no way for someone outside the institution to really know what's going on there unless there's like some sort of a website, I feel like. Whereas other, or, like I feel like my experience in the medical school here is that often people are recruited from within, uh, like uh, like a fellow or a resident or I don't know, something like that to do like work on projects. And like you're not recruiting some fellow from like, you know, another institution usually. Right. And that's because inherently with like clinical training, fellowships have a research, comp you know, clinical fellowships often have a research component to them. And so the expectation is that, you know, faculty um, that are, you know, at the medical school have, um, you know, a, a lab or a research group that that offers training opportunities for them. So that that is right. true. And I've also even here uh, in public health, uh, you know, some like large studies, you know, large cohort studies, like if they need to recruit someone often, you know, they'll, 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 it'll be someone who's already here. Um, who therefore doesn't need a website to tell them what's going on necessarily. You know, they can just talk to whoever it's, you know. So I think it's less external facing. And I think um, for like, so for like in statistics, we often, well, I think most people are encouraged to have websites just because there's a lot of just mixing between institutions that happens. Right. I, re I recall something, maybe it was back when I was getting my master's degree in the school of public health. I think someone, faculty member stood up and, I don't know why I was at this, you know, in this class or whatever, but a faculty member stood up and basically said, if you don't have a website, this was to a graduate student audience, you know, like rule number one for getting a job is you need to have your own website. And this was, as you know, a long time ago. Yes. And I was, I was sort of sitting in the audience, blown away, thinking, I don't have a website, you know? I mean, not that I needed one, right? Because I was over in the medical school, and but that was... Well, I mean, look, imagine what could have happened. Oh, exactly. That's that's a good point, right? Um, I think, yeah, it's interesting because that is... Um, what am I trying to say? Like, you know, so, for example, our students, like our PhD students, when they graduate, they will hit the job market, and they could in many cases, go anywhere, internationally, perhaps, right? So, um, whereas I feel like a medical, f like a fellow in the medical school, <laughs> that's not their trajectory in general, right? They could go to another institution, right? Right, but that institution is not evaluating their website. Like, that That institution, you know, evaluating their CV, and then, and then you know, the subspecialty training world is so small, right, that you, you know, I know everyone in academic allergy immunology, um, you know, pretty much. And so there, there is this network that has a lot of influence in terms of, you know, where people end up for jobs. Yeah. And they're being evaluated, not just, especially more and more as time has gone on for, you know, the vast majority of jobs have heavy clinical emphasis um, and there are fewer and fewer jobs that have a heavy research emphasis right and so you can't I mean what, what are you going to put on a personal website if what you're promoting is your you know <laughs> clinical prowess I do think that it, I don't think it's quite I mean I think it's nice if you're a student that you have a website like and, and you know today it's kind of easier than it's ever been uh, but I don't think it's quite as important because ultimately, if you're applying for jobs, they're going to get your your CV and resume or whatnot, right? So, um, but I do think it's important if you already have a job, like if you're like on a faculty somewhere. I think it, it it can be important, at least in my area, it's important to have like a presence out there on the web where someone can Google you and you know see what you're up to. Because if you are trying to attract students and postdocs or whatever, it, it is nice to have a presence out there. Uh, uh, and so that people know that you're like a real thing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that you're still like working on stuff. Right. You know? So, well, your website was old before and I have not seen your new one. So I'm looking forward to checking it out. Did you update your picture? 
it's in a different place now. That's the thing. Well, if I Google Roger Pang, well, I don't know if you'll find it if you Google me because um, it hasn't quite, the web the web hasn't like you know updated itself. So you'll still get my old web page if you just Google me. But it's rdpang.org is my new website. Oh wow! So it's much simpler. Look at that! You, got, you your picture is the same though. The pictures no, it's it's a different picture, but it's from the same photo shoot. Okay. <laughs> So I'm the same age in the picture. That's the critical thing. Yeah. You just never age. I never age, yeah. Oh, look, the effort report. It's on there. Yeah, it's, high. it's a key current project. Exactly. I see that. Yeah. Excellent. All right, moving on. Yes, grant follow-up. I was going to talk about my R25, but I think I won't do that right now. I'll wait, uh, I think, until the next time. Okay. Um, but I do have another grant that I want to talk about. Okay. Which is so uh, I had a... R01 that went in, I guess, back in, this would have been in October, or November, it was a resubmission that I, we, that uh, Jeff, the friend of the show, Jeff Leak and I wrote. And uh, this was a resubmission. We talked about this, like, the first time around, I think. It got, like, a, I got, like, a 48 or something like that score. Right, and there was, like, this widely varying views among the H- reviewers. Hugely varying right. range of scores, right? So the reviewer one was, like, sixes and seven the fives and sixes or something and then reviewers two and three like were ones and twos mm-hmm. so i we haven't so we got the score back this time the re, the resubmission uh we don't have the summary statement so we don't know what the reviews were uh but the <laughs> the score was a 53 oh no <laughs> and and the percentile wow. was we were percentile was exactly in the 50th percentile wow yeah what happened do you think so, so that's what I want to talk about. So first of all, I think we've said this before, like for a study section to to discuss an application and then give it a 53 is like unusual in my experience. Not impossible, obviously, but it's unusual. So some reviewer, some reviewer convinced other reviewers that it wasn't as good as they thought it was in the beginning. Well, that's one. So one possible. So if it's a 53, right? It could be that everyone just gave it fives, right? Or some, or fives and sixes, right? But that's not likely because if everyone gave it fives and sixes, then it probably wouldn't have been discussed, I think. Right. It wouldn't have made it in the cut. Um, the other possibility is similar to like what happened last time is that some people really fought for it and some people just flat out hated it. In which case, you know, sometimes you've been on study section. So like, you know, what happens typically is that there's a list of applications that are decided we're going to discuss these. And once you get to the end of that list, um, usually it's like, uh, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock p.m., you know, in the afternoon. Everyone's tired. Everyone wants to leave. And then the SRO, the scientific review officer, will say, are there any other grants that you want to, quote, unquote, rescue? Rescue, yes. Uh, yes. The dreaded rescue. And I would say in my experience, most, like, it's only happened a few, few times where someone's like there's one more grant i want to look at right and usually anyone on the panel can rescue a grant right um but there has to be a reason like if you you can't rescue a grant that you yourself scored like an eight (laughs) you know like i think the sro would be like why do you want to do this right 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 but if you scored it like a two or a three and everyone else scored it low worse then you could make an argument that like i think this should be discussed because of blah 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 right so (laughs) but if that happens then it's like you know, the study section's already kind of cranky, you know, and you're making it go longer than it could be going. <laughs> right, right. Which I mean, is... it's hard to see how, quote unquote, rescuing a grant actually truly rescues it in right. any way. Like yeah. that it has any material effect on the outcome. Right. And that's how you end up with the score with like like a 60 or 70. <laughs> with, uh, with it, or it can be how you end up with a score, like a discussed score like that. Right. Um, anyway, that's it. That's it. Might have happened in this case. I don't know. We'll have to wait for the summary statement. So the question is, what do you think? Question for you, as the closer, uh, is what should we do? Um, without knowing anything else, if I think something's a good idea, I, I don't generally let go of it. Okay. And what that means, I think, depends on the circumstances, right? Like, are there other funding venues are there um things that could be done where you write a paper or something 
and then revisit it as a brand new R01? Do you take part of it and make it an R21? Or you get what I'm going after. Yeah. Um, I mean, there have been, on rare occasions, there was one grant that I was a part of as a multiple PI, and I think we've talked about it, which I still, like, there was, uh, I blame it on the study section. (laughs) There was no good study section because it sat at the intersection of, like, housing policy and disparities and asthma, and so we wanted it to go to... um, IRAP, which is um, focused on like pulmonary diseases and asthma, and it kept being, and it had air pollution in it too, and it kept being diverted to the social sciences study section and failed miserably both times. And that grant has never kind of gotten revived, but it, it wasn't really like the, the, methods and approaches that were in there really relied on the expertise and and resources that someone else had to tap into certain data sets but that's the only and i still think it was a good idea but it wasn't really just mine to sort of champion or move forward right and um and it was problematic because it was such a like transdisciplinary grant that it's hard to see how it could get funded at NIH unless there was a specific um, RFA that came out that seemed to hit, hit the sweet spot for it. Right. That's the kind of situation where you have to like write a commentary that says there should be an RFA on this topic. And then <laughs> when, there, when there is an RFA, you can be like, look. <laughs> Perfect. to just, just what we were looking for. Yeah. What a coincidence. So I don't know. that, But, it's, you know, so what that needs to look like, I think, is hard to know until you get the summary statement back and like only you and Jeff know like how important it is to you and how good of an idea you think it is. And well, okay. So here's my conundrum and tell me if you think I'm overthinking this. Okay. I've had many grants where like it just didn't score well. (laughs) Right. Like, and then it's kind of like, well, I still think it's a good idea. So let's try to figure something out. Like you said, I don't know if that's the case with this grant. It could be the case. If that's the case with this grant, then so be it, right? Uh, but if it's like last time, what can what? I guess what uh, what's the word? It kind of like intrigues me about this is that it could be that some people loved it and some people hated it, right? Which is not an experience that I'm that familiar with. Usually, <laughs> everyone just hates it, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, so there's a possibility that like some subset of people really like fought for this grant, right? Maybe that's a good sign. Well, it, the question is whether it should be overinterpreted or not. So, the one interpretation is that not that it's a good or a bad idea, right? But that it's a controversial idea, right? Right, and so it's and so the question is, what do you do in that situation? And is it any different from what you might do? In, like, if I if we get the summary statement back and it's like everyone kind of agreed that it, the idea kind of sucked, um, then I'm not sure there's a lot, there's not a lot of room to run with there, at least with this study section. Right. Um, but if it looks like it was very controversial and the spread was like large, right. Then, then here's my, here, here's my thing. <laughs> and I know this is like, this is a bad idea. I was just say from the get go, this is a bad idea. Okay. But yet you are offering it up as your proposed next step. I just wanna I just wanna get your feedback on it. So what if we go to the program officer, right? So the program officer has nothing to do with the review, right? This is not the review is over. We're moving on to the program officer. And the program officer is part of the chain of command for like deciding what gets funded, right? And we say to the program officer, look, based on what we know, some of the reviewers Gave it a good score, like a re- not only a good score, but like a really good score. Right. Like I'm just this is all hypothetical, right? Uh, so which means that the idea is controversial, right? It's risky, right? Um, so we what if we encourage the program officer to take that risk because like it could be a you know a big win. You have attributed more agency to program officers <laughs> than. I have attributed to program officers. That's not how these things go down. Yeah, I agree. But 
there well okay i think the issue is there's no logic <laughs> there's no logic for a program officer to take any risk like this whatsoever really right and there are i mean there are people who depending on the program officer where they are in the hierarchy who have you know more say in what the portfolio looks like of that institute but yeah the vast i think you know the majority of program officers you talk to are not ultimately the deciders i mean they are at the table having those discussions but it it, it's not one of those things where someone says to, you know, their boss or their boss's boss, oh, yeah, we got to put this one in. And the boss's boss says, oh, yeah, that looks great. Let's go for it. <laughs> especially especially one based on risk, an argument based on risk. Right. <laughs> right? Like the way that that happens is an argument based on like, well, what do we want our portfolio to look like? I mean, it may be that disparities is a hot button topic. And so they look at all of the grants that were, first of all, they t typically look at the ones that scored on the bubble, right? Like they're not going to go. <laughs> they're, they're not going to reach so far down. Yes, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And they look at the ones on the bubble and they may say programmatically, you know, we of the ones that were below, you know, met the cri pay line criteria, we don't have anything that fills X gap. So let's look and see if there are things around the pay line the fill X gap, but yeah, there's so many levels of uh, wrong in your, in that idea. But like, that's a, that's a bold idea. I think you should try it and report back. Okay. I think, I mean, what do we have to lose at this point? It's not getting funded anyway. Right. Right. So. Right. right. <laughs> Make I mean, an argument to a single program officer. Who's not actually the decider about a grant that like, wasn't even close to the pay line that they should really strongly consider funding it because it's high risk. Well, like, wait, so just to be clear, who do you who would you say is the decider? I only understand the structure of one in, like the org structure of one institute really well. And it's true, the different institutes are quite different. It's it's kind of surprising sometimes. Right. Yeah. And you know, there's different terminology like sections and branches or whatever. And it's it's usually the person who it's not a single person who's the decider, right? but the person who's in the most powerful position and probably, you know, runs the discussion about what things to fund is not the program officer that's listed for the grant. They, they're either the boss or the bosses or, you know, or, or, the, or the boss of the boss of the program officers that are listed with the grant. But there's definitely like necessary and sufficient conditions, right? Like I think if the program officer hates your grant, I mean, it's oh, tough, right. Right? Right. right, right, right. So there is that influence, right? It's not like the boss is going to reach down and be like, I don't care if you hate this grant, I'm doing it, right? Like, I, right, I mean, right. that could happen, I suppose, but um, it's uh, unlikely. Yes. Um, so a program officer, some program officer has to be behind it, right? It's going to fall under who, someone's program, basically, right? Um, and they're going to be responsible for it. Um, and so if they're not behind it, then you know, then it's never going to fly. So someone has to be behind it. So I think the step one of a long series of steps is getting someone to back it, basically. Right. Um, it's not the end, but it's the beginning. Wow. You are like so, like your your level of optimism during this episode is like shocking. <laughs> I, it's just because I've never had a grant like this one before. It's so weird. Like, um, it's just a weird feeling. I just have all these weird feelings inside me, you know. Yeah. Well, the most important thing is we got to take care of those weird feelings. They have to be resolved somehow. <laughs> they have to be destroyed, basically. Destroyed. <laughs> I said resolved, not destroyed. <laughs> You're more gentle than I am. Yeah. I have I have a grant follow-up. I'm just going to lay it out there because I think maybe we can continue these grant discussions in future episodes, which is that I submitted an R34, which is a clinical trial planning grant in the fall. And similar to your grant, this was the initial submission, but I have a score, but no summary statement. And the score, there's no percentile given with it. Um, and that's true for some NIH mechanisms, but it makes it very hard to interpret your score, right? Um, and the score was a 35. So I'm also looking forward to a conversation with the program officer. How would you interpret that score in this context? Well, so it means... You know, there could be a spread amongst the reviewers. You'd have no idea. Or the reviewers could have come to a consensus that it was 
somewhere between a three and a four, which is like, you know, an excellent to very good grant with, you know, uh, minor weaknesses and maybe a couple of a moderate weakness or so, right? I mean, that's about where that falls. But each study section has its different sort of distribution of how it scores things, right? And so yeah. you're, um, there's some grants that get in the 30s that get funded because that's a good score for that particular mechanism or and or study section. And I just don't know. And here's one where I wonder if the port, how much the portfolio matters. And sometimes when there's no percentile, um, it sort of means that that institute wants to create kind of a portfolio of these clinical trial planning grants, right? Like, and that's that's true of like often of like a center or program project type grants. There's no percentile, um, and I think my interpretation of that has been um, that that's sort of deliberate because the Institute very much is thinking about their portfolio of grants that they fund, not just, you know, with a straight up investigator initiated R01 where they are taking the top X percent and then, you know, maybe reaching beyond the pay line for, for some things to fill out their portfolio. The ones without a percentile, the portfolio is front and center. They're strategizing about it. Yeah. 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 Should you talk to the program officer? <laughs> I'm go- I'm going to talk to the program officer, but I'm waiting for the summary statement, which actually should be out this week. And are you going to argue that it should be funded? I, I wasn't going to like. I was mainly going to try to understand from them, you know, where it was along the spectrum of consideration for funding. Got it. Which I don't, you know, but you're making me wonder whether instead of asking that question, I should well, I should ask that question and then follow up with a pitch. <laughs> or not yeah go for it but i it depends on how they answer. i mean go for it with the complete with the with the being 100 percent secure in your knowledge that it will have no impact whatsoever yes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean the pitch not the grit right right right, right. yeah so i mean that's kind of how i feel so but all right we have some follow-up then for future all right yes episodes the grant discussion never ends yes we're back to cover letters, and um, we'll link to this tweet from Ian Sudbury, who tagged us in the, this tweet. Um, he said, at, at the Effort Report, saw this and thought of your previous discussion about cover letters, and he linked to this thread by Ann Silverman, who um, tweet has this whole thread because she has worked as an associate editor for the past few years. And she says, I find that the curtain was pulled back on many aspects of the publication process. My behavior as an author and a reviewer changed because of being an editor. And she says, how you ask. And then she launches into a a thread, which is actually, I thought, quite interesting. And her number one thing that she opens with is that cover letters matter. And, you know, I had talked about how I thought cover letters didn't really matter. And I think you mostly agreed with me. I, I can't. I, yeah, I totally agreed with you. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I think it, you were like, I don't even write cover letters. And I was like, I write cover letters, but they don't matter. So she says cover letters matter. And that she used to use the same cover letter for every submission as an author swapping out the title. Now I cover the highlights of the paper as well as why the submission is in scope of the, you know, target journal. Um, And she basically says, you know, because the first decision an editor makes is whether the paper's in scope. If it's on the border, it's going to be harder for the editor to find reviewers who are excited about the work. The paper may be fascinating, insightful, and important, but if you aren't sending it to the right place, then it likely won't be successful. Read the scope of the journal, determine how your paper aligns, and state that in the cover letter. This will speed up the publication process and get it to the right reviewers. And she has other things that are worth reading about, but the main thing I wanted to point out was this cover letter idea. So yeah. does that change your mind at all? Uh, well, what <laughs> what do you think? What do you th- what, not, not what do you think about me. Like, what do you think about the thread? Um. I sort of have this cadre of just a few journals that I submit to, and I know 
and they tend to be clinically focused. And so there are certain, you know, the subject matter clearly is within scope, right? Because I focus on asthma and, um, and so I don't think for me personally that they make that much of a difference. And, and I, and I have data about that because I don't really get desk rejections when I send my papers there, right? Well, you're just that good, though, right? I mean, oh well, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't disagree more with this thread. Like, <laughs> I here's what I here's here's what I think, and like some I think there's a lot of people who maybe don't remember the old times, right? But like back in the old days, right? If Elizabeth Matsui were the editor of a journal. Like the way that papers would come in is that like if I wanted to submit a paper to your journal, I would like print it out, put it in an envelope and like mail it to you. Right. And in that situation, you would have no way of knowing whether like your buddy Roger Pang is sending you a paper to read or whether I'm submitting a paper to the journal where you're the editor. Right. There's no way to know that. Yes, absolutely. So unless I write a cover letter that says, hey. I want to, I want this paper to be considered as a submission to the journal of whatever you're the editor of, right? So then you know, okay, I'll put this in the journal pile and not in the like personal correspondence pile, right? Which I'm sure is what you did, right? Right. Someone may have just like snail mailed you the paper because they thought it might be of interest to you. Yeah. Well, I mean, or of like I'm your colleague and like I want you to review the paper, right? How am, how are you going to do that? I have to mail it to you, right? Now we live in a world of computers, right? And not only that, we live in a world of like the internet and like the journal website <laughs> knows that if you're submitting a paper through their like manuscript submission system, that it's for their journal. Like they already know that, right? And so like 90% of what a cover letter is for is now no is gone, right? Do you need to explain to them why your paper should be in that journal? I mean, sure, but usually the title of the abstract gives that away, I think. And and if you're saying something in the letter that's like not in the title abstract or paper, then that's like a little fishy, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, if you're, I mean, if there's some secret thing that you can only put in the cover letter, um, that's like weird, right? So, I, I I personally do not see any need for a, like a to spend like a lot of. I mean, some I like uh, we were. I was having a discussion with someone where it's like some journals. Like you can't get away with this because a lot of systems just like require that you write something in there. So right, fine, right. obviously do that. But um, I mean, it's just I don't know. I, it's all I have to say. That's my rant on cover letters. Yeah. Or well, we're I think we're we have we are we were not swayed by <laughs> yeah. that argument. <laughs> um. All right. Pet peeves. Pet pet peeves. Uh, this is going to be short, and I think I've I think I've used this one before. Twitter is just getting on my nerves. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I I don't know why I'm like I'm in like a thing today. Yeah, like sarcasm. You know, it's unusual for you. Anyway, I don't even think I need to say anything else except for like, it's it's uh, depressing to see. This, of course, highly selected sample in the medical, biomedical world, sort of unable to um, see or express nuance or engage other people in a nuanced way. And obviously, there are some people on Twitter who are able to do that or use Twitter kind of differently, but um, it's... It's a shame. And I had like curated my Twitter feed because I get, as we've talked about, a lot of really great information about the pandemic. Um, and, you know, many of those folks continue to give great information about the pandemic. But um, in some cases, there's just in insanity has taken over. I'll just leave it at that. Let it be. All right. <laughs> Unless you have something to add. I have nothing to add to that. It's uh, nobody could have seen this coming. <laughs> um, I think we'll skip lessons from space today and get right to the main. Okay. M the the main topic. This, this main topic has been pushed like three or four times now. So right, right. So it's important that we. So you'll we'll you'll come back to lessons from space in episode one thirty six, right? <laughs> exactly. So this is about. Um, and, and 
I'm sure this is not good terminology, getting covert resources from your institution. Or there's no such thing as a free lunch. They're not really covert in the sense that like people don't know about them. But I get your drift. Like they're kind of um okay, I don't know what the word is, but we'll maybe we'll talk about it and the word will come to me. They're not announced as available. Un- unadvertised. Unofficial? I don't know. Um so there are different types of, of resources that are kind of intramural or come within your institution. And the first obvious one is that institutions I'm familiar with do have some kinds of internal grants um, where, you know, those are announced and they often target early career folks or they're trying to provide some sort of seed funds that will help people be able to compete for um, extramural federal funding. So that that one is not, you know, that one's, um, I would say, is advertised. But there are other types of resources that no one, I think, really, like, there, there's no lecture in your curriculum as an early career researcher where people say, you know, here are the unadvertised resources. Um, but they're worth understanding. And like, if you, this is a place where mentors can be very helpful in sort of identifying opportunities for these things. And some examples of them are, someone may come up to you and say, oh, we need someone to do X. I mean, you can fill in the blank about whatever it is. It could be managing, you know, uh, the fellows curriculum or um, starting an asthma, severe asthma clinic or um, some, those are the sorts of things that could, could um, be asked of you. And many people, the knee jerk is, oh, sure, I'm happy to do that. But that presents an opportunity to negotiate <laughs> and get resources because um, for a couple reasons. One is that it takes time. So um, you can think about whether it makes sense to ask for salary, salary support to do that job. The other thing is that it takes some resources to do that job. So all of those things require maybe admin support or some sort of support from clinical staff, et cetera. Um, and that's not necessarily gaining resources by thinking about those things, but that's ensuring that you're not the one doing the administrative work, if you take this on. Um, And uh, the other thing is you could think about how that might then allow you to reduce your other obligations. So maybe it would be much better to tackle X, which has been asked of you, but get rid of Y. Um, And so sometimes you can negotiate that. And that, in my mind, is um, a resource in a sense, because you can shape the portfolio of how you how your time pie is allocated. The time pie resource and then there are ways to share resources as well. Um, And sharing of resources, maybe sharing of uh, time from staff or personnel that that has some downsides too. But sometimes there's there are ways to share concrete resources. Like if you have some money, but you want to purchase this large data set, but so you don't have enough to purchase all of it, you could go in with someone else. And that that example, of course, is separate from this notion that you have been asked to tackle or take on a, a certain role. Um, but nonetheless, that sort of thing exists too. So I'll pause there. I'm sure I've forgotten some kinds of examples of these sorts of things um, that you you may have remembered, or I'm sure you have commentary about this. <laughs> um, well, I just do a, one quick comment about the internal grants thing, which, like you said, is advertised and not a secret. Um, but on the other hand, they're not always at. It's not like. There may be internal grants that are applicable to you that are not advertised to you, I guess is what I would say. Um, and like, for example, our university has like a email that goes out with a kind of like a bunch of like internal, like a list of internal grants every every once in a while. And I'm always surprised by like how I've never heard of any of them. <laughs> 
and and not all not you know it's not like they're all applicable to me but like the fact that i've never heard i mean i don't know about any of these like they're just not you know because they're advertised to like a small group of people or whatever you know so but that's weird to me what's weird that they're not advertised well, you know, it's like the our camp. You know, our campus, like it's so disjoint and decentralized. So, like, if there's like an internal grant program that's like comes out of the arts and science campus, like it's unlikely I'm ever going to hear about it. Oh well, that that's true. Yeah, even though it might be applicable, right, you know? right, right, uh, and, and vice versa. Like, I think if someone in arts and sciences could apply for like an internal grant here, like I don't think anyone would. They would never find out about it. So, um, anyway, that kind of stuff does happen. So it, it is useful to keep your eyes open, but. Um, the other thing I would say is that I think a general comment is that it can be a little, you have to be careful, especially I think when you're in the, at a junior level, I did this to you'd be careful not to just think about things in terms of resources alone. Um, and I think, cause I think that's like, is a tendency to be like, I need to accomplish X and in order to accomplish X, I believe I need these resources. And I think that's fine. Like you need to be able to map that out. Um, and then go to whoever's your department chair or whatever and say, I need these resources. Uh, right? Right. And uh, without saying the in order to accomplish X. Right, part. right. And, and I will add something else, which is that you want to make sure that accomplishing X is something that your department would love for you to accomplish and that it would be good for the department, too for X or Y reason, and it's helpful to articulate that. Right. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that it could be that there there may be, quote-unquote, covert, covert resources <laughs> <laughs> available to help you to accomplish X, right? So for, like, one time, I remember I was very early on, I, I wanted to do some project, and I thought, okay, I need to write a grant to fund this project because that's what we do around here, right? And I went to the department chair and I said, you know, I need to write this grant. And he's like, well, why do you want to, <laughs> why do you need to write this grant? And I said, well, you know, I want to do this project. It was like, I, don't, I can't remember what it was now. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and so the interesting thing there at that time for me was like, yes, like, what do I, what am I trying to do actually? Right. And then he's like, well, you know, and then he, he kind of went through a couple of things that the department had, some resources the department had in terms of like personnel and whatever. And the point, his point was that, like, you don't need to write a grant right away. We have resources. We could get, you could get started, right? Right. Um, and it never occurred to me to, like, think in that way. Uh, and in part because it's like, what do I know about, like, the resources that are spread across the department? Like, I just kind of just got here, right? Right. Um, and so it's, um, it can be, and I think, and I think, so, on the, I mean, on the one hand, it's often, like, as a professor, you're on your own. You got to, like, fund yourself, whatever, Right. Uh, but there are some things that we can share across the department. That's why we have a department, right? <laughs> um, and so it's uh, you should kind of figure out kind of what is there to do. The other comment I thought was interesting that you said is that, um, you know, there is a sense of like sometimes less is more, right? Like you can not gain something, but if you reduce something, then you have gained something. Um, and uh, I, I think we don't often think in, the in those kinds of terms because it's always about like, well, you know, more is better and more is more. Right. Um, the other thing I thought you were going to say um, when you were saying it's not just about sort of tangible resources is some um, some resources are kind of intellectual resources. So um, if you are asked to do some sort of have some sort of role, take on some sort of role, it may put you in proximity with um, people you may want to interact with more that it might, it might otherwise not be natural for you to interact with them. And um, I don't know, I guess this is, is, would be true in your field too, but I'm, I'm thinking sort of like in the clinical arena, like if you're in charge of some sort of clinical program, there's then an entree to... Um, a group of people who is a network who do that particular sub sub field of, of clinical work. And they may be a part of a clinical trial network as well, or things like that. Um, and so those are not sort of like the immediate tangible resources you need to effectively 
um, execute what you need to execute in that role, but there are these kind of intangible, they're less tangible or maybe longer term resources that have to do with kind of professional networking, professional development, intellectual resources that may become available or more accessible to you if you take on this role. That does not mean necessarily that those types of resources are so, are so worth it that you, you know, assume that you shouldn't ask for salary support and admin support or whatever else that you need, right? Right, right. But it is something to consider when, you know, evaluating, you know, an opportunity that's put in front of you. Yeah, that's trickier because it's like, I think the return, the return from that tends to be diffuse and difficult to quantify, you know, to kind of measure. Doesn't mean that it's not worth it. It's just that um, you're, you're that kind of thing. You're in for the long haul, I think, yeah, or at least for a little while. Um, and so it's it's harder to kind of justify in a concrete sense. The other comment I was going to make is that I think you also have to be cognizant that you don't want to be the person who's like in your department chair's office every week demanding resources, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> so. I don't want sort of my talking about this to um, be interpreted as, you know, every single moment like, oh, someone asked me to uh, facilitate the journal club this week. So I'm going to go ask for salary support for facilitating this one journal club this week. Right. That's not that's not at all what the message is. It's, um, you know, obviously it's when you're being asked to do something more substantive than that. And the message is it's important to carefully think about the resources um, that you would need and to consider asking for those resources, but think about how you package asking for those resources. And this is where um, I think a mentor can be very helpful. Yeah, I think it seems like, I feel like from this discussion, there's kind of two scenarios. Uh, the, one is where you're being asked to do something and the other is where you want to do something on your own. Right. Um, and I think the, when you're in the scenario where you're being asked to do something, then I think the, the bottom line is, you know, make sure you have what it takes to do that. Right. Um, and so you have to figure out, well, what does it take for me to do this thing? Right. Right. Um, in the scenario where you want to do something, I would say it's more about, I think if you need, you know, beyond just like your mental capacity to do this project, um, then you should start with kind of like, well, what do we have right here, like right where I am to get this job done, right? Because it could be that there's more than you think. Um, and if you don't, if you have no idea, like ask around, I would say, um, because there may be, uh, you know, the department has a special fund for doing XYZ research or something like that. Or maybe they pay for a student to, you know, to work in a certain area. Or maybe, you know, there could be all kinds of weird random things that maybe you don't know about. So start at home first, I guess, before you kind of reach out further. Um, th that's kind of my bottom line, I guess. Yeah, and I think that's true for, for sure. And then also your negotiating position, I think, matters, right? So if you're in a soft money environment and you're, you've run out of grant funding um, and your boss comes to you and says, well, I want you to establish this clinical service line because it will cover this part of your salary um, so that you'll continue to have a job. You're not in a strong negotiating position to kind of, doesn't mean you shouldn't ask to, to what, for what is needed to make it successful. It just, again, means that you don't have as much leverage in that situation. Well, I think that depends. It depends on, you know, if your alternative is that, you know, maybe you leave, you know, then maybe that you do have stronger leverage than you think. So that's a good point. It depends on your alternatives. Right. Right. Anything else about the mis the misnamed covert resources? Yeah. <laughs> have you ever tapped? Have you ever tapped into any of these? Um, have I ever tapped into any of these? Um, yes, I would say to some extent. Yeah. Especially when it comes to like one, for example, sh sharing personnel, I think is one right, right. Uh, example. Yeah. Yeah. We should, I know we're going to wrap up, but I'm going to follow up about this because there's, there's some other sorts of resources that I 
don't think I touched on, which is a different category of resources. So there's a little like cliffhanger for the next episode. And maybe if the listeners can uh, chime in, let us know what kinds of hidden resources are available. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, weekly grind. I so I spent all of last week writing a review paper because it's due soon, <laughs> and uh, I had to get it written. So I uh, did it, and it was you know turned out okay. Was it torture? It was no, it wasn't so bad. I mean, obviously, it wasn't like I started from scratch. I just had to do the writing last week. Um, so I did spend a lot of time thinking about it beforehand. That's a, so you feel productive. I feel, yes, I feel very productive. Excellent. And then that, but that's it for the year, I think. That, I mean, that was my week of productivity. That's done. All right, mine is going to pale in comparison. I um, had to deal with uh, page proofs for a paper. Ah, and uh, were there many mistakes in the proofs? Um, no, I don't think so. Good. <laughs> <laughs> job well done yeah that's it that's that's you know maybe we should talk about page proofs at some point in time <laughs> <laughs> and whether they're necessary no, exactly sorry. <laughs> yes exactly all right so i think that's a wrap you can find us on twitter our twitter handle is at the effort report and you can also email us our email address is the effort report at gmail.com thanks everybody for listening